So, um, I'm talking to David on the last month coming up here. Um, I need to make one thing clear. My talk or my opinions um, are about rails in particular. So, the Ruby language. My, my, what I would like to talk about, this isn't a technical, I don't want to have a technical presentation, I don't want to talk about APIs. Um, all languages suck, in different ways, all APIs as well. Um, but the Rails, in particular, community, and the common community, which also has some of these issues. Uh, just a little bit of background, I currently work for deskwanted.com. Uh, it's a small startup in we build tools for co-working spaces. Um, we're based at a data house, and the first version of deskwanted.com was written in uh, 2010, and it was done in Ruby. from Berlin, but the company is based out of Boston for a couple of years, uh, also developing a, a reservation system in the common list. So sorry, that was not a web application. It was a big airplane ticketing, airline ticketing software system. Uh, that was about 150, 120 common list developers all working under the same roof. Um, I stopped that in 2009, uh, at which point I took a year off from software development and then I got back into it to work for Guess One. Yeah, so you didn't found it? Sorry? You founded Guess One? I did not found Guess One. No. I'm not a founder. I've always been paid. Mm -hmm. um, I have been there since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm not. Okay. Um, the decision to use Ruby, I was okay with, but that was not my call. They said it was a Ruby job, and I took it. Mm -hmm. I said it was a Rails job. Um, 
Had you, had you used Rails prior to that point? I had not. So, so my experience with Rails is about two years, uh, just on different, um, and it is over the last two years. So I'm not a Rails expert. I mean, I built a big website with it, but I'm not, you know, I don't have five years of experience. And if I say something that is complete bullshit, I would love it if some other people would call me out on that. Okay. Uh, I, I do, I'm an opinionated person, so I tend to make my decisions and then stick with them. So if someone holds me to it, that would be nice. Um, anything else about me? One thing that might explain how I came to some of my opinions about Rails, um, I do believe as a principle in developing 100% solutions to things. So when I was developing web applications in Lisp, and I thought continuations would be a cool thing to use in Lisp, mm -hmm. instead of using something else, I wrote a common list compiler to give me continuations in Lisp. So that's the kind of stuff that I do, and that's what feels right to me. So that's what I look for in a framework. So, where should I start? Uh, what was first on the list? My laptop is having technical difficulties, so I don't have my notes. Um, the feel of the libraries. Can we start there? Well, why did you take the job? Sorry? Why did you take the Rails job? Um, I ran out of savings. Mm -hmm. I, I needed money. <laughs> and there are no uh, common list projects. I, I had at that point been doing common list for almost 10 years, and I wanted to do something different. Um, there is, you, you can fall into a hole if you do the same thing, um, and you don't, if you don't use something daily, you don't really get to know it. You can play with things, but you have to really force yourself to use it to do something to really learn it. And I felt that I was at the point where it was a common list. I, I knew it. I was, I was proficient. Um, and this was a good job. And why not try something different and see if maybe I've been going about the web application wrong. A lot of people speak very highly of Ruby. Uh, Rails. Sorry, I, do, I mean Rails. Um, a lot of people use it to great success. And I've seen some great stuff that will do. So I was a little bit curious. Um, a little bit of, yeah, I didn't want to keep doing the same thing forever. Um, and a little bit of that was what the job was, and the money was good. Um, so did you have any experience in Ruby or Rails when you started that job? I had, um, I had been playing around with Excellent just written in Ruby, the configuration thing. Um, I had downloaded Ruby a while ago, um, but the syn so I, I could type the code and I knew the syntax, but that was about it. So when I needed, um, what was one of the first things we needed? The first things we needed was an internationalization library. I had no idea where to look. So I just moved it. So I was on the internet with it. What was there? Um, I had to learn IRB. I didn't know how IRB worked or what it was. Um, chosen by my bosses um, with was fairly clearly told they weren't sure if I would be sticking around very long. And they didn't know me. I mean, this was a friend of a friend who said, yeah, this guy can program. Let's hire him. And they wanted it done in something that other people knew. And they are not technical people. Um, they have a lot of friends in the startup scene. And a lot of their friends spoke well of Ruby. Um, I do not remember yet what the company was, but there was a company that had very vocally used Ruby that had just gotten $15 million from some VC, um, and they wanted to do what the other people were doing because the other people were being successful. Most of them. Well, the ones that end up in the newspapers, at least. Uh, the other ones you don't talk about, so you don't really notice that. But they came from a context of those people are successful, those people are using Ruby, let's use it. Those people are using Rails, let's use Rails. 
And the so what did we start doing with Rails? Desk Wanted was initially a search engine for coworking spaces. Um, I don't know if anybody knows what a coworking space is. I don't want to get into the whole description, but a desk that you can rent for a short period of time, relatively short. Think of, let's pretend it was a hotel system. It works just the same for this conversation. Uh, what we built initially in Ruby very quickly was a way for you to upload the data about your hotel, because your users of Desk Wanted are mainly people who own these places, and provide a public listing and search function for people who are looking for desks or hotel rooms. Um, we did that, the functionality for that took, given that we didn't know what we were doing, it took about a month. From nothing to something on dev.desk1.com. And that was great. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I needed to, you know, we didn't really know what the fields that we wanted were, we didn't really know how they related. Go in and change something. They might have to restart a couple things, but Basically, five minutes later, you're done. And within the context of building a web wrapper around data that is related to itself, uh, Ruby let us get up very quickly and let us test out ideas very quickly. Um, and that was when I started to think, yeah, this is the right, this is great. These people have figured out the web application Problem. And have given us not so much a framework, but you know, like the pieces of a car. And then you pick: Do I want the big wheel or the little wheel? Do I want four wheels or do I want two wheels? I just put the wheels that I want. And I have to know how cars work to do it. But basically, you know, I have the thing done. Um, and so that was great. And then we started to want to do things that we does not make easy. Um, in particular, we wanted to use Ruby's model to model a data set where we had a couple million records. And all of a sudden, many of the okay, sorry. All of a sudden, um, started running into problems where we did not provide uh, a simple solution. And, and so this was sort of my first introduction to the community. Because I had done all of this based in isolation. I read the documentation, I downloaded Ruby, I built my application, and I was happy. And now I have a problem. You know, we have, we have all of these locations and places in the world. We have a database of all these locations. And we want to manipulate these locations in the world, and there are millions of them. And so I started talking to um, Ruby people, either on IRC or on personal mail. Um, there are a lot of Ruby people here in Berlin, and I started talking to them. And a lot of the initial reactions that I got were, that's not the Ruby way. Uh, which is certainly true, it's not the Ruby way. It wasn't easy. Um, where, where I started to have issues was, okay, what is the Ruby way? This is my problem. I have to solve this problem. How do I do this? And, um, and I got a lot of great help on how to solve that particular problem. But it involved pulling back the layers of magic that Ruby, that Rails puts on top of Ruby. Um, it involved trying to debug class eval or instance eval statements. Um, tracing methods that don't you really get defined anywhere explicitly. Um, and actually, because actually, that's, that's, that's a good point, I use the word trace because I think of common lists trace. I was definitely looking for tools that I could recognize. Okay, So I came to Rails, and when I had a problem, I wanted to trace a method. So I was definitely coming from a common list background where I had certain tools, and my approach to debugging my approach to problem solve was based on those tools. Okay. I wanted to be able, I wanted IRB to give me a stack trace and let me inspect a nested object that it was printing. And it was giving me the dots and telling me how big the thing was. 
But I wanted to know, well, what's the fourth one? Because that's the one where I have the bug. And how do I go, and how do I look at the fourth one? And, and so that's sort of where my frustration began. Um, I don't know if, was I doing it the wrong way? Was I, was I approaching the problem the wrong way? Um, possibly. Um, did, do I think that Ruby as a toolkit makes that difficult? Yeah, I do. Do I think that the people who develop in Ruby are not aware of what they are missing and therefore do not develop what they are missing? Um, I also do. And I find the reaction um, and let me qualify what I'm about to say. There are some really great, really smart Ruby people, Rails people. And there are some really serious hackers who do their work in Rails. And I mean them absolutely no disrespect. Uh, the guys you find on IRC absolutely love, love Ruby, and if you don't, fuck you. And fair enough, you know? I mean, that was, that was sort of an issue for me. Now, coming from the common list community that had Eric Magnum and Zali, who, if those names, names mean anything to you, they are not nice people. It, I mean, Eric Magnum is famous, unfortunately, he was famous, um, for just ripping people apart, for not being smart enough. Okay. So it's not that the common list community is this wonderful paradise of helpful people. But there is something endemic about the Rails community where asking for help um, was difficult. And, and I do believe that it's related to something that I then discovered recently when we started looking for Ruby developers. Desk wanted um, in January decided it's just Marco. Marco is overworked, Marco is stressed. Marco had already quit twice, but we probably should keep him. <laughs> so maybe we should get Marco some help. Um, and also, Marco keeps asking for more money, and we don't have more money, so. So uh, we started looking for Ruby programs. Um, initially, we started looking for a Ruby shop. So we said, let's let Marco do, or I said, let me do sort of the interfaces between the technical people and the business people, and let's find a development house that the Ruby code that we built, and do the things with it that we don't have the time or the energy to do. And they'll pay us, and that's why we have financing, and great. The, a lot of the Ruby people that we encountered, and again, you know, that we encountered, so it might be different. Ruby was, they were comparing Ruby to Java. They were comparing Ruby to C Sharp. They were comparing Ruby to PHP. And, and for me, that explained a lot of their enthusiasm for Rails. But I found myself constantly repeating, you know, Rails isn't the only thing that's not Java. And, and I definitely, the dynamicism, the malleability that Rails has, that Ruby has, the things that it lets you express concisely, and then you can write code to take your code and write boilerplate. I really think that's great. But the Ruby way of doing it does not allow that to be debugged, and it's not structured. And when, when what is the code that you get referred to when you look for a library, when that starts concatenating strings as Ruby code and evaling it, I, I agree with the goal. I, I totally know where you're going. Um, that's not how I would approach it. But that's because I wouldn't be using strings in the first place. I wouldn't get to that problem. And, and when I was having this discussion with, the, with people with you know, four or five years of Ruby experience, which was about the most experience we could find in a Ruby hacker, um, there was, I was unable to explain why that for me was an issue. I was unable to get across, I was unable to justify why I didn't like that. And I think now I can. You know, 
now it's been six months, I've had time to think about it. And it has to do with the tools that commonness gives us that, well, it's not just commonness, I mean, it has to do with being able to have a structured way of modifying your code. With, when it comes to languages, the Lisp family of languages, let's say, I can macro expand things, and the macro expansion exists as an entity that is then seen by my debugger, by my development environment. Um, can someone open the door, please? The phone, the phone thing in the left, but from the left. <laughs> when, it, when it came to Rails, um, I was unable to find that. And, and attempts at um, with certain people. And again, you know, maybe I just didn't find the right people, or maybe I didn't look hard enough. Um, I was unable to, to explain why this was worth the effort that I was asking people to give me to help me do it. You know, I want you to change your library so that I can get a record of what you're doing. Why? We don't need that. that print statements are enough. Or if you're debugging, just read the docs better. That's in the docs. Read the docs. True, you know, and and maybe I was maybe I wasn't able to understand. Um, but this is an opinionated talk. This is my experience, and I wasn't able to understand. Um, and I wasn't able to explain why that was a that was a problem. So that was that's sort of what I want to say about the community and sort of what I said about the feel of the libraries. Um, I, I just, I don't, I like the final result. I don't like how they go about doing it. And I feel that when things break, it is very difficult to figure out what broke. Compared to where I was coming from. Can some of the Ruby people tell me I'm wrong? Or, 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 or that I misunderstood? I mean, I can, I can tell you you're right. <laughs> I think you totally hit the point when you said um, the thing is that I know common list um, and I look at Ruby like, from a different point of view than uh, most of the Ruby people you've talked to, which come from Java background or Kind of, I, I have been using Ruby for like five years, and I haven't missed that until I come randomly started to play with Common List like a couple of years ago, and, and then I said, oh, this would be good. But until that point, obviously, if you don't know anything, any tool that uh, works that way, it's difficult to just uh, miss it if you have never seen it. Uh, Described as the blood paradox, like all the paradox. Right. Yeah. Oh. You can't you can't see you can't see up the the hierarchy of, of language features. You can only see down. There's there's some place not much, but there's some place there. tools in, in early versions of Rails, but they were moved it. And I have no clue why, but they uh, there were a, a GAM or something uh, mm -hmm. which you could install for debugging um, your Rails code. 
So, so then you have the possibility to um, to set a breakpoint in, in the form of a function call mm -hmm. called break, I think, and then you will end up in an IRB session with all objects accessible, as far as I remember. That will be a, a, an equivalent to to Rappel with right. trace and and other stuff. I I don't ex I wasn't looking for. I wasn't looking for slime. Okay, okay. I, I would have settled for less. Mm -hmm. That would have been mm -hmm. worth. Yeah, I, I know it was hard to find. I, I know that it exists, but I haven't used it. And I just a few kind of sessions. And it was about two years ago. So. But is it not, not a cultural thing, too? I mean, the, the, um, the tools that you use in Ruby are kind of low tech. And and it's it's not well. It's kind of the antithesis to to like Java, where you have all these huge lines and all this automatic stuff. And in Ruby, you have a lot of or Rails, you have have a lot of uh, just shared knowledge or no knowledge, uh, but you get things done quickly. So so it has this hacky approach that also is kind of intransparent in a way. And well, the the fact that they just remove the debugger because. <laughs> Print statements are really not, not, it's, it's, no, no. it's actually true. I mean, it's, it's, uh, print statements are valuable, and even, even with, uh, with Lisp, we use them. So. It, wasn't, it wasn't an issue because they preferred uh, print line debugging, but it was, I don't know, I can't remember, I think it was an incompatibility, in, incompatibility mm -hmm. between um, one point, uh, Ruby 1.8 and the 1.9, I think. They didn't find someone to pay. For <laughs> maintaining the <laughs> that, that has been fixed. Uh, so the debugger is there. It's, it's not. It's not as powerful as as it would be in in this okay. for okay. obvious reasons because so it's because there. the the code is is form of strings. They're about and they're then it vanished. So right. for, uh, by the reason it's yeah. impossible yes. to do a debugger like yeah. you could Let's do in this and I don't know very much Lisp. <laughs> But uh, well, it's it's there. It's, it's it's a bit low tech, like you said, but it's there. Mm -hmm. I think this this comparison is not, not entirely fair because uh, uh, the, the Ruby folks just just do more uh, more unit tests and uh, uh, and they don't rely as much on on these dynamic things. So mm -hmm. they they tend to uh, uh, they they would argue then that, that you should run test which exposes this problem before or in, uh, in, in not in the running application but in, in Tests code, and, and then obviously the, uh, uh, the, the debugger you, you, you have there has, has never uh, uh, been any anything like like uh, Lisp debuggers I think because you, you can't really see the code, so it's not like GCC where you um, uh, what's it called G GDB where, where you uh, where you see and step through through the, the code which is running, but uh, uh, you can only access objects on the stack and print those, but um, uh, otherwise uh, you're you're kind of blind. So that's that's much less than you even had in, in, in Java, for instance. But I, I think your point about their their answer being you're going about it wrong. Which which I mean I, I don't know. I think it's pr it's probably cool if you if you have a running application can look into it properly. But that's that. But that I mean been. that that is that is one way of doing it, and unit tests are certainly a good way. But. You're allowed to say, I'm not going to help you with your problem because you shouldn't be at your problem. Yeah, that's, that's not that, fair. That, I mean, that's fair. <laughs> but the, the idea that we don't need a debugger at all because we should do more unit testing, the idea that, that there is a Rails way and that's it is a perfectly fair way to go about it. And, and I can understand let's put all you know let's put all our focus into this development path and this way of developing. But it is not mine. Yeah. And and I do have unit tests and I still want to debug it. Yeah. What, why not write a slam packet? Or because if if I have uh, if if what instance eval does leaves no trace. How the Ruby interpreter doesn't support uh, introspection 
good enough to be able to write a spy for a movie. You can you can write a good uh, debugger when when you can hook into certain actions that the compiler does, and you can show them to the uh, developer, or you can override and so on. But if the if your compiler or interpreter doesn't have those hooks, things just happen, and you have no way of either printing, overriding, stopping. You have no way of knowing that it happened. You you just see the results sometime later. So. Uh, Writing slime for Ruby would mean rewriting the internals of the Ruby interpreter, and I suppose quite a lot. And, and really, that isn't even you know, why that, if that's possible or not, is just a matter of code, right? But, and, and you know, why don't I do it? If I spend enough time, I probably could. But what, what surprised me, and the reason. I want to have a conversation with Ruby people about the culture was my feeling from talking to some of the Ruby and reading some of the Ruby stuff that they didn't want that. And, and that's kind of what I would like to you know, express is this, this is our way. So, so um, you wrote this application in Rails and then at some point you got frustrated because you couldn't find someone else to either get into the team or uh, take over the project and then what happened? So right, we tried, we tried to hire Ruby programmers um, and Berlin is a great city to be a developer in. It is not a great city to look for developers. <laughs> um, we were unable to find someone who, um, for whatever reason, we were unable to find someone and then it was just myself, and faced with uh, rewriting an application that we had basically decided we're either going to rewrite it, we're going to rewrite it. Why? It was just too slow. Okay. It was too slow, making changes was too hard. Do you know why it was too slow? Um, so, our templating system was homegrown because of people constraints that we had as far as designers going not being able to use DRV. Mm -hmm. um, they, it was decided that we could save a lot of their time if they could write in HTML. Mm -hmm. So we wrote a templating language that looks exactly like HTML. So that was a personal constraint that had nothing to do with technological mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and we were getting you know, four or five second page load times. Rubyprof didn't explain anything. Caching helped a lot but didn't really solve the problem. Um, when we hit, uh, we were hitting five, six simulated simultaneous sessions, so like five, six requests a second with our little test script. So very in-house, very. Um, and that was, you know, that was three, three, four, five second page load times. And we couldn't figure out where. We asked around and the answer was, you know, Add more servers, <laughs> um, and and I just at that point I was already kind of frustrated mm -hmm. um, with some of the answers that I've been getting, which was usually just. You know. um, so then what we actually did was we said, fine, we're going to rewrite it. Let's find somebody to rewrite it in anyway. We don't care. We'll outsource the whole thing, and all we'll do is we'll send specs to someone. We'll send specs and they'll send us bills and they'll leave. <laughs> um, that, uh, we went back to Poland a bunch of times, met some really nice people. Um, there is a consulting company in Poland that I would suggest to anybody if anybody needs some PHP developers. Um, we decided to not go with PHP. And so then the question was okay, what do we do? And at that point, I personally had decided that I would be sticking to test point for a while. So the mark of getting hit by a bus problem wasn't a problem anymore. I didn't have a lot of time. I had a lot of features to do. Um, and me being me, I did it in what I was best at, independently of whatever social or business constraints we may have had. Um, I did not. 
not tell my bosses either. So I just did it. Um, and I did it quickly, and it was fast. I got lucky. Okay, I would not suggest that. If you want to keep your job, don't do what I did. Um, I got lucky, and it worked. Because I was implementing something that I had already done once. So I knew exactly what I needed. I knew the features that we cared about. I knew that speed was important. I knew that graphic designs were expensive, etc. So I learned on the Rails version, and then I took about two months, and I did the whole thing anyways. Um, and then, what for me was the major test, we hired an intern, um, who was a guy who was really smart, quick learner. Uh, unfortunately, he's watching the Iron League game tonight, so he said he can't come, but he was invited. And um, we gave him the code. And I was really worried that he would just look at it and sort of faint and not understand it. Um, and he definitely had problems with the syntax and stuff. Um, but he didn't have problems with the code. Um, he doesn't write it, but he can understand it. He can read it. And just as a point of reference, I gave him some of the Ruby code just to look at. You know, I was curious. So for a day, Sean looked at the old disk one, and it wasn't any more understandable to him. It was yeah. Did you, did you, well, with, with Rails, what you get is like a huge framework and a lot of shared knowledge that you that you use to, to write the application. Did you do that with this or did you just start from scratch? Um, I don't really understand the question. Well, <laughs> did you use anything except like an HTTP server in this to rewrite the application? Um, so we used function tutors. For some of the reasons that we didn't like Rails, we ended up dropping postmodern as well. So it's not like this is immune to that. So. Mm -hmm. um, postmodern, uh, Hunchen Toot, um, CLO Auth for talking to Facebook and Twitter. Um, what else? Tr the, all the various trivial packages. But just the bunch of things that you expect in, to be in a language today, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I wish I could expect Swank to be in a language today. <laughs> sending should not be as hard as it is. There should be a send this email, I don't care how you do it, make it go away. 
And <laughs> Mel, Mel Base, is I think what we're using? Yeah. And I have to create an SMTP folder that I have to copy my message, but then the, so we need to send text and HTML messages together, and that's weird, so we end up right. We wrote our own um, RFC multi type wow. alternative. Because you didn't know CL9 existed, or? You didn't no, because it breaks on some of our. What? Yes. <laughs> yes, we broke it. Okay. Um, well, we broke it. Um, I didn't have a lot of time. It took me two hours to fix it. It took me two hours to write my own RFC generator. Um, but did you did you use the the same uh, templates? And we did. Oh, that's nice. So yes. you basically replaced just the backend for the same templates and well, same same ish templates. So same ish. Um, the original templates had uh, Ruby code embedded in them to get at the various properties of the objects that you wanted to replace. The new now templates have sort of a, a weird Lisp syntax embedded in them, so that had to all change. We did a rapid redesign in the process, so we don't still use any of the same templates. The template language that we had written in Ruby we wrote in Lisp, um, which the Closure guys um, who have helped us with some of our work, uh, Closure Common Lisp Consultant. Closure Z, not with J S. Yeah. <laughs> um, the guys who maintain uh, CCL, the implementation, have done some work for us, um, and they have promised me that they would clean up and release this templating library um, at some point. So that that's actually going to get released. Um, but yeah, so we rewrote that so we could use the same templates. Um, we started off with the same JavaScript, but that's that doesn't have to do anything with the list. Um, Did you change it to Perlin script? No, because I don't want to write the JavaScript. Okay. You know, and, and, and I mean, I have ended up writing a lot of it, mm -hmm. but it is important for us so that people who know JavaScript can come in and do their JavaScript stuff. Mm -hmm. Just like it's important for us that people who know HTML and style sheets <coughs> can come in and do their HTML and style sheets. So we do still use SAS, uh, as CSS for mm -hmm. our style sheets. Because mm -hmm. that's great. That's just, that's wonderful. Um, so we have Ruby running on the server, watching the directory and recompiling to, to CSS um, all the time. Um, but also that, we chose that because CSS is SAS. So someone who writes CSS, it is also this other syntax. And when you, want, when you slowly learn the other syntax, then you can use it. I can't slowly teach people parent script. Yeah. You either write in parent script or you write in JavaScript. Which is also why we don't use CoffeeScript or any of the other weird JavaScript syntax. Um, I've talked a lot. Uh, I don't, what was your, no, did I answer your question? Did you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, you, you had this NI, NI uh, not invented here syndrome versus a don't invent anything here syndrome. I mean, that's kind of, kind of uh, obvious. From what you've told already. Yeah, I mean that that's sort of come out. Um, I I also I think one of the so one thing I'd like to add to that is that I get the feeling that in common this you either don't find something or it's really well done. And and in various applications there are fifty percent hacks to lots of things. And and those hacks, I mean Desk Wanted is full of hacks. But they're not hacks in the context of Desk Wanted. They're hacks if you try to release them. They do exactly what we need, the way we need it, and if you need to read them, you read them. But I would never release our RFC generator page. It's just ugly. Um, whereas the Ruby people, in a sense of community and sharing and giving stuff to other people, release that stuff. So you go looking for an IAT net uh, localization library, you find 12 of them, of which 11 and a half suck. <laughs> and and I, I like the sharing that goes on. I like the, the back and forth, you know, the, 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 the GitHub patching, sending back and forth, how easy it is on GitHub to grab a Ruby library, make a change, and give it back to the function. 
That is a huge pain in the ass for Blizzard. I mean, it's not a pain in the ass, but... That's uh, where, where, uh, one question uh, can, can be... Um, because uh, um, Ruby Gems is quite, uh, quite, quite handy in, in yeah. Rails as well. And you use, uh, I think it's, it's uh, Quick Lisp? Yeah. Like that? Um, so, again, this is me reacting to something that happened before. Um, we, we had problems where I got really, really scared of updating anything on the Rails version of the server. Because I was never, I could never be sure that nothing else would break. And um, Bundler, for whatever reason, even if I tried to pin things, it was sort of difficult to say. This is an experimental version of this library. I have patched this. Please do not change it. Please don't. And it would still change it. So um, what we have done for the current Desk Wanted is I have gone by hand and I've downloaded all the libraries we need. And there's a directory with all the code that Desk Wanted needs. And when we install a new copy, we download it from there, and I know what's in there. Mm -hmm. And when I need to update something, and I don't usually, I update things when they break, then I go and I change that. And that is not because GEMS is broken or even a bad idea. GEMS is a great idea. Uh, and I wish we had Quick Lisp, you know, five years ago. Um, but, but then it would be broken today. Yeah, so... You, you think it would be worse today than, than five years ago? Than the, no, I think, I think package management systems have a certain lifespan and then they're just deteriorated because, because they are getting too big and the original maintainer is not there or uh, too many versions are in there. So, so it's, it's, it's really something that you can see all over and all over. It, it works for a while and it works very well and then, then you see the point where it just stops breaking. But the, the, has anybody tracked how many hours Zach puts into quick lips? I don't, I don't have no idea. It's, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a weekend per, per month. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what it gives you is just a snapshot that at least compiles together and that's, that's worth a lot. It's, it's, it's a good starting point for that third party directory that you just collect your stuff in the DEs and then not, not touch it for a while. How, how does it compare really with uh, Ruby Games? Is it, is it same thing? Or? No, it's centralized. It's totally centralized. And, and, and it's released in a monthly fashion and Zach, the guy who owns it, uh, well, makes sure that everything compiles together. So, so the, the interdependencies are uh, working and you can be pretty sure that whatever is in there works to some extent. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's really worth a lot because, because that has enabled um, using libraries much more than, than, than we had before. Because before it was always a pain to find the libraries. And all these bigger things had these huge lists of versions that you needed to download. And, and I'm HashiTube maintainer and I killed the whole section on what you need because you don't need it anymore. You just install yeah. it and it works. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's great, but uh, it's, it's painful for the one person that owns it. And it, uh, doesn't well. I don't. I don't expect it to be the 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 to the end solution. It, it, it will. It will be ending something in the future. I mean, by so it's years. really easy to have this whole known library of this yeah. Whole thing. Yeah. And they are all distributed from uh, from uh, Amazon, mm -hmm. so so you never have any download problems or anything. So we can just open the window. I mean, maybe. Do you have any? Well, do you want the list again? You why I wrote Ruby? Well, or? I mean, I mean, this this is this is great the way it's gone, but yeah. I am dying. Of so let's take a break and open the window and uh, just, just open up the discussion. There's there for two euros there. Yeah. yeah. Can I have one, please? Yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> so, so Mark, you claim that you you re-implemented the best. Sorry. Ah. The the best the best, the best yeah. of. Rails in a thousand no, miles. No, so the, 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 I, so two things I want to say. One is that there is when you use only one thing, as I used only common list for a long time, you do fall into holes and you don't see what other people are doing. The uh, Active Record people decided that we should generate the programmatic interface of the database from the d database schema itself. We should not have def table class and then define all the columns and define all the types in our in our list and then repeat the same thing 
in some create table SQL statement somewhere. That is genius. I, I have no idea how come nobody figured that out a long time ago. And when I discovered the information schema, which is a sort of semi-standard way of finding that information, is years old, I was even more embarrassed to not have thought of that myself. Uh, and I think the idea of generating your database interface layer from the database is, is, is just incredibly smart. But that's not really true, right? You always have migrations. Well, so only, well, no, you don't need migrations. Well, in Rails, you have migrations. Yeah, because they didn't. Yeah, it's still true because there's no, no other principle, uh, uh, primary definition of, of the schema anywhere around. You, you, you do the modifications and keep them around, but um, yeah, I think it's true. I mean, I run 18 migrations. My database is something. Yes, but it's, it's a, I mean, migrations are for like a long running project, right? right. We have like, uh, you know, hundreds of migrations right. of adding columns, removing columns. Right. And then you get essentially like these event horizons where people stop maintaining uh, migrations and are just like, oh, after this point, it's no, there's no more going backwards, mm -hmm. right? Because there's so much complexity there mm -hmm. and how the migrations have evolved over time. So that, that is one of the, the things that's always bugged me about active records. It makes this presumption that, you know, uh, database schemas are quite clear in the database, you know, with an aside of migrations. And I haven't seen that scale, so I'm interested but I mean, to see I mean, how you guys solve that problem. At, at, at any given point, I connect to the database and I say, what are you? And right. it tells me. And, right. I, and I build my interface code from that. Yeah, I mean, uh, introspection of, of everyone can open up a, a, an SQL prompt and, you know, and do the definition. But it's, I, I like having things in code, right? Or I guess I was one of those people who always preferred uh, data mapper to, to what you call it, to Rails. So data mapper is an alternative to that where you actually put your schema definition, you know, in your in your model code. Okay. And you have migrations on the side as the you know the deltas of that of that of, of, of that schema. So who's where who where's the authoritative who's right when the two differ? Well, one is the delta, like one is the first derivative, right? And one is the, the actual value. So in your model code it says how are things now? Right. And then your migration is like how you got there. But I, I guess I don't really care how I got there at, right. on a certain level. I want to know this is my database. This is what I'm running against. That's what I want. That's what I have to talk to. Mm -hmm. what, where you care, where you care, how you get there, when you want to have a copy of it, then you have to replay it. Right. So after a long, when, when you when you have an, a really old uh, uh, Rails project and this this uh, you have so many migrations that they're it becomes a bit uh, uh, unstable there. And you can also have, have run, run uh, sta uh, SQL statements against the database directly, and uh, you do uh, weird things, and then it becomes a bit un unwieldy after a while. But why do you with, it's mostly with, I think it's mostly has to do with the, with the migrations. But why do you keep the old migrations around? Um, the project where I've been working on yet. No, you, you, you can you can you can always get, uh, um, you can you can upgrade and downgrade and, and always have uh, uh, have a have a have a definition in basically in patches of the of the most of the right, why do you need more than a few a few versions old? That's the default mode of Rails. That's the thing. That's like right. it's assumed to be that way. But when is this a problem? When does this will be you know, when you lots go, of deploys, I guess? Yeah, when you have you know, when you have multiple people working on the same project for multiple months. Or that, this is just in my experience. Maybe it's like one of the caveats of how I program that I run into this. But a lot of older Rails projects that I that I've joined later in its lifespan, like, have always suffered this problem. But because there are still uh, instances running with very old versions of the database, or just the assumption that migrations, right, will always be able to run from beginning to end, that seems to break down the longer a project goes on. There's also it, it can happen that you, that you have changes in, in the database and you can't. Uh, uh, you, have, you have some suddenly SQL somewhere which wouldn't run on uh, on another exactly. version and things like that. It becomes really weird. But Marco, well, one of the uh, list impetus is uh, we write everything in list, so we just write a something like a class definition in list and deduce the the database schema from that. And what you say is um, that you are now switched to the mode where you. Uh, 
uh, introspect into the database and uh, uh, like define your uh, your list model from the database. Mm -hmm. it, it, it turns out SQL is a much better language to write relational database definitions yeah. in than list. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. Surprise, yeah. I mean, we do generate a lot of lists from that SQL. Um, we, we generate a lot of update, insert, select statements. We do a lot of joins. So we, we generate list objects with the right joins. But it's all generative code from the from the schema. So so you express um, the the relations between the tables and uh, the well the, the M to M relations in the database, and then uh, uh, deduce your your in memory model from that. Or? No, no, it's much stupider than that. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> no, it's 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 a very thin layer. Mm -hmm. So there the end to M there is a uh, a list object in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, even the one to n is an array of the other objects. And you have to tell it, please fetch all the other ones. Because if you don't, it, it won't. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's lazy. It, hmm? It's lazy. No, because it won't do it automatically. You have to tell it, go get those. Yeah. Well, that's what it is. So know, like, what, what do you mean you're lazy? Who's lazy? <laughs> <laughs> well, usually, uh, I think. In active, recent versions of Active Record, it's smart enough that if you like, oh, give me, you know, all the users, right? They'll be like, oh, here's this, you know, abstract object that represents all the users. Mm -hmm. And if you do like dot length or something like that, it won't fetch and materialize all those objects. It'll do a count, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of lazy in the sense that it only loads the data into, you know, the VM space that it needs to fulfill. It's a fulfillment. Easy, easy loading, but automatic. Exactly. If, if, if I want to know how many users there are, um, it's select db user, and then it's literally select count star. Yeah. So I have SQL in my list code. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's represented as there's a nice syntax for doing that, so that Emacs can then like swap things around. But effectively, I have SQL code in my in my code because my data is not I, I'm not my data is not a relation of list objects. So my, my data is tables and columns. And that's yeah. how my code manipulates the data looks like. Mm -hmm. So I end up writing, you know, big chunks of SQL in my code. Yeah. And that I guess that allows you to, you know, not suffer the uh, the impedance mismatch when you switch into things, more advanced features like store procedures. Right, because there is an yeah. impedance mismatch because I don't yeah. try there it's it's not we actually call it it's a relational object mapping, not an object relational mapping. We do not put, <laughs> we do not we do not try to map the list object model onto the right. database. We make it relatively easy to map the relational model to what are effectively arrays of arrays. And that's as far as it goes. So when you when you wrote uh, that you re-implemented uh, the best of rails in one thousand lines of list, what, what would that include? Uh, that was generating uh, query selectors and CLS objects from the DB schema. Okay. Which, when I was going through, that was the one part of Rails that just struck me as being just brilliant, and I hadn't seen that before. And everything else in Rails, I had in some form or another already encountered, and it fit together, and, and it worked. But there was nothing fun. There was not. There was no fundamentally different approach in how Rails looked at the problem. Whereas when it came to Active Record, or ARL, or ARL, whatever it's, I guess, relation, this idea of, let's not even try to define the model. Let's ask the data. And that just makes sense. Of course the database is the model. Well, yeah. So that, so that, was, that was the part of, of, of the Rails framework that really struck me as being new and interesting. And that was, Explain why you why you, you didn't see um, this uh, continuation based approach fits in this, or explain how, how it works really because I don't have a clear idea of what it really is. It it makes so that I got interested in that approach when I was writing an application for uh, doctors and nurses in a hospital, where they had a very complicated flow through a web application. Uh, these were, in particular, these were questionnaires that would take hours to complete. And every step depended on certain factors in the previous steps. Uh, for example,
example, you know, the canonical example is I have a, a and this, this was well before Ajax, this was well before JavaScript was anything more than on click equals alert or something. Um, and so everything was done server side, everything was done statically. And the problem that I had there was how do I maintain the state of this flow? How do I deal with people going back to pages, changing their answer, and having that affect the next three? And to that, being able to pretend that a web request is not an asynchronous thing, being able to pretend that I can read from the browser and have that block, and I can, I can write my code as if that waits until the user answers that specific read request. I mean, I would not have been able to complete that project without that kind of simplification. Um, when it came to the case of Desk Wanted, uh, Desk Wanted doesn't need it. And I was already, I mean, I was already kind of worried about using this at all. Um, I wanted to keep it, you know, as close to what already existed as possible. And we would not have gained a whole lot. Some, some of our parts of the management flow might have been easier, because there, there is a sequence and going back does influence what comes later. But, you know, we can make it easy enough. Well, when you have a kind of like a tree of, uh, of, of screens or something. Yeah. When, when you want to be able to sort of time travel in your web application, you want to say, let me go back and pretend I did something different, but keep this reality active. If you have continuation, if you can clone two browser windows, and you can follow two different paths simultaneously, and it'll all just sort of magically work, and you look at your code, and it's a linear step of things. But your browser windows, you know, you're just messing with history and you're going, you can go back to it. How, how does it look in code? Is it, is it like, like one uh, function which basically... It's, it, it's literally a read from browser. Sorry? Read from browser. And you get okay. a, you, 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 that sends out an, an HTML page with a form in it, and you get the form values back. When that particular page as a consequence of the pages that came before it responds. Did you call something like white for client or something like that? No, no. We, we maintain a... Okay, it has been a long time since I looked at on Common Web. Um, so the, what the continuation is, is basically... Yeah, how does you, it? You, you, make, you, you make this call, you make this call, and then that, that stack that you're in sort of gets stored somewhere. And then later it gets pulled up as if it had returned without, without having gone away. Like a VCR. Now that you can resume it multiple times at right. the same point. Right. It, it is your, 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 your stack, your dynamic stack, is an object you can manipulate. That's safe somewhere. Hmm? In a, in a, in yeah. a hash table or in a um, Actually, we got to the point of being able to serialize it. So we could dump it to the database. And then, and then bring it back. Um, I mean, the, 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 the level of, I mean, yeah. we ended up, we wrote a commonless compiler. Yeah. I, for fun? Well, I mean, <laughs> I got paid to do it. It's like a quiet Tuesday evening, and you're like, yeah, I do this. <laughs> um, so, there was a... That's what you do the micro. Uh, sort of. That's like chapter two of sick or whatever. It's like, oh, now you have the syntax. Now to make your own. <laughs> no, it, it, you tend you tend to get there very organically. You you tend to start small and and you start with doing it all by hand, and you start you know you start writing functions where you say, okay, I could write a continuation passing style, which is this this way. Every time I send a request back, I'll copy the state that's interesting. And I'll say, when this request comes, here's the state up until now, and then do this. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll have that for every single request handler. And then you say, well, that's just stupid, because this is always the same. So then you'll write what ends up becoming a very big macro, but what starts off as a little macro to make that easier to write. And then you'll make the next piece easier to write. And then you'll say, you know what? I'm about a weekend away. If I just implement if I just have handlers for if, let, 
phone call and lambda, I'm good. And you've written in the code for it. So, so, so you write handles for if, let, phone call, and lambda. And you're like, great. And then you want to call out to another function that uses macro let. Like, All right, fine, we'll do macro let. And you're like, well, I'll do macro, I'll do macro. And then really, your load time value, eval when, you're not far. <laughs> you're not far from taking linear code and just saying, you know what? Do it. Yeah. And then you realize, okay, well, the code that I generate is literally megabytes, and I managed to blow up SPCL's compiler because it can't handle. But then you say, okay, I'll fix that. It's you never sit down and say, I'm gonna implement a continuation passing style transformer comment. You find yourself one day and you say, you know what, I'm that far from it, so you do it. But of course, compiler writing comes easy to you. This program is because you start out with macros and these are right, you, little bits. I mean, it's, it's not, you don't sit down and do that. You just, I mean, what are you compiling into? Like, you're not list. <clears throat> I'm compiling from list to a list that I was already basically writing, because I was doing it by hand. But so, so it's not like you're writing you know, machine code or something. It's not that kind of compiler. Yeah. No, no, it's not. Yeah, it's not. It's more like an annotator in the case of continuation passing. You just annotate the existing list code uh, with your compiler uh, with some additional state. So it carries around the state implicitly. So it's just, well, you could write it by hand, but you don't. <laughs> Why would you? Well, and I don't actually know the answer to the question, and this is going off topic, but, um, but like, I mean, does SPL, S SPCL, for example, like, is it, does it actually write machine code and there's there's code paths for different architectures and stuff? Yeah. 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 And you can even write a sample. No. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. almost all of this is just like, uh, I mean, I, I initially, well, not initially, after I realized what I'd done, I tried to just copy SPCL stack. But that was hard. Mm -hmm. I gave up. Um, yeah. So that's, that's how you, you get there because that is the because copying SPL, SPCL stack is really hard. Isn't that the most awesome part of it, right? That you didn't have to like sit out on this quest, you know, bring three of your friends and you know, rewrite a list compiler. Just like, oh, this is the natural conclusion to what I want. <laughs> that, that, that's when it works out really well. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, but the, the it thing doesn't with work. With an interpreter. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> the thing with marking an interpreter is that you start with one form, then you write another one, which means that the total space of code for each Handles right. gets larger. So you write a new form and another one, and uh, it depends on where you want to start. There's no predefinite barrier. If you if you want to start earlier, you can manage simpler code. But if it's suitable for your task, you can stop there, or you can go on and you know, until you get a full interpreter. But the, the the flip side of that and that is. How many list packers have written with temp directory? <laughs> Every single one that I know. With temp directory? Yeah. Well, uh, I wrote by the group. There are several uh, that built in an Allegro uh, world. See, we have, we have two right here. We there's, a with, there's a trivial temporary file <laughs> <laughs> because of that. Really? I mean, yeah, I just released that it's in quickly. <laughs> yeah. So now nobody else has to. <laughs> So I, I think that's sort of the, flip, the flip side of the easiness, is that you do get repetition. You just no, there's a, a, it, it, it's not easy. Writing the proper uh, Unix stuff is not easy. Writing with temporary directory properly is very difficult. Exactly. Unix. But I don't need you, that, right? You know my what? app mm. is, I know what my context and what my environment is. And, yeah. and so in my case, I don't need a working complete with temp directory. I need the four line version. Yeah, sure. You have assumptions between your code. Right. Did right. nobody and, and ever try to, to create another temp directory with the same name? Or exactly. Or, I mean, how could you know that if I... If you don't have the collisions, then... Oh, I don't have to, right? Very easy. But that's, 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 that's kind of my, my point. My version of doesn't handle collision. It doesn't need to. It knows that it runs single threaded and that it is the only process with the only thread of the only process with write access to this directory. This directory. Yeah. So it's a counter. That's all it is. <laughs> Works for me. 
And, and getting back to the, 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 the Ruby Rails conversation, the Rails guys share a lot more than you do. We, God, I'm not a, this, the Rails guys share a lot more than the common developers do. Because it's, the, 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 the bar for them is a little bit higher. And so you, that's a, that's a good thing. What do you mean by sharing? I mean, when I look on, no, just let's say GitHub, how many um, right. Rails libraries there are to do something. I find a lot. When I go anywhere and I look for common list libraries, I either find the perfect 100% solution, yeah. or I find nothing. But aren't there, aren't there lots of articles about that? Better? Like, this programmer is just like doing it themselves? Um, like why share doesn't... when you can just write it to find it? <laughs> <laughs> that, it's, it, I still don't think it's a good it's true, yeah. you know, I, I still kind of, and also, I, I don't know if you're here, I spent the last hour ragging on Rails, and I kind of want to say something nice about Rag away? Rails. But no, I mean, I, I don't think it's always good. Uh, because there are a lot of things that get done, you know, badly a couple times. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, you have, you have stuff like this that, that has a lot of subtlety and complexity, to, to really truly get right, um, that you know to 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 do it well, you know takes somebody putting a lot of thought into it. You can get an eighty percent solution, you know, in twenty percent of the time, twenty percent of the, the effort. But I know for me personally, I would rather find, you know, a hundred percent solution or. 99% solution and use that, then take 20% of the time to write the 80% solution for me personally. That, that, that's and my take, which I think is... Well, one, one thing with, li with Lisp is uh, that many Lisp hackers don't want to release something that's not perfect. Because a lot of Lisp is really perfect in a certain, well, if you have a certain view on things. Uh, and then also, well, that might be different with Ruby where people are freely releasing stuff that is just about to work. And that's a good thing because it actually shares uh, knowledge and shares uh, uh, projects, which doesn't happen that, one, that much in the Lisp community because people are so, so like, um, obsessed with Yeah, my, my, my next talk will be called Why Any Whites Destroy the Lisp Sharing Community. <laughs> 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 yeah, but just look at Hanshintoot, it's so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, but again yes. back to this point of, uh, of to share or not to share, right? When Rails was released, it was uh, far from perfect. A mess. Right? It was it was a disaster, <laughs> right? And yet it was, you know, a little mini cultural revolution within its own space. Just because it got more people making things that they would not be making. You know, if you forget about programming for a second and think about like just technology that could have been maybe And isn't that really the appeal of closure, right? Is that people who write closure code, it could be perfect, but it exists in an imperfect ecosystem that has things like Netty and uh, you know these rock solid libraries that get that, you know, that really, really hard problem like F Sync. Does anyone want to, you know, implement F Sync in Common Lisp? Not really, because that is a hundred percent case, right? It's really, really hard. What, what do you mean by F Sync? Like F Sync, like the syscall, like the thing that oh, makes sure yeah. that things are on I this. Know, I know. Yeah. But that's one of the really hard problems of computer science and coordinating f syncs is what, you know, some databases are good and some databases are shit. Yeah, but I, I know it's, it's difficult, but uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of part time DPA. Cool. So I, I know X3, how to mount it, or use XFS, or use. The problem with, if you go down, that down below, syscalls that have the same name, but they don't behave the same. Yeah, they you behave differently on different uh, file systems too. Yeah. Okay. So you have lots of stuff that 
more or less says it will eventually do this. Exactly. But with what with what uh, performance you don't ever know. Well, I yeah. think I think your point is that uh, Closer has an advantage in using the JDM, which gets world class support and support by people that are really paid a lot for doing things right, and that's yeah. that's an advantage that neither Commonist nor Ruby have. have. Yes. I mean, we, we are basically volunteering to do things right and we are arguing endlessly about little things while the Java guys are just getting paid for implementing specs. And that's, that's why I, in implementing categories, I go look at Java, not at their API, but at their engineering, at their implementation. I copy the implementation. <laughs> That's but not, but not the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> implementations down below, uh, especially for stuff that uh, used to be written by the by the experienced guys, you know, with some developers themselves, and yeah. so on. That's where you can down below interfaces for it <laughs> in Java. But especially now that we have open JDK, browsing through the code is awesome. A Java compiler and common list. <laughs> 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 you, you <too. laughs> there's, a, there's another one. Uh, David, uh, David, I thought you were meant to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened? You were like, oh, I need to unload, you know, yeah. the JDK 7.1. Yeah. It's a like yeah. license yeah. agreement. <laughs> <laughs> it's 4 p.m. I could be done by the time Jeopardy's on. Like, let's do this thing. <laughs> Stop thinking about how to write a web application and start thinking about what can a web application do. Right? And, and have you seen, um, there's a talk, and I forget the exact title of it, but it's something like, something on principle? Yeah, that's Brett Riker's uh, Inventing yeah, yeah, yeah. on Principle. Inventing on Principle, thank you. Um, have you seen the talk? Uh, no. Okay, Stop what you're doing. I'll send you a yeah, Don't watch the talk. <laughs> Seriously, it's amazing. I'll, I'll send you a link. But, but I'm in the, uh, in the video on the right side. I'm the guy who's like raising his hand. When he's, like, <laughs> he's dropping these bombs, and I'm like, I'm wasting my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree next time I watch it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, he, his, his basic thing in there, since you haven't seen it, is just 
shrinking, shrinking the separation between a creator and, and their creation, right? And, 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 and trying to make it so that, so that you have, I mean, like one of, one of several of the specific examples that he, that he has is he has, you know, a, basically a, a fractal image of a tree, right? So, so it looks like a tree, it looks like a living tree, um, but it's actually, you know, just a fractal bit, right? And so, but he, and so he's able to like, he, so he, he has an editor where he can like click on the, on the numbers that control the behavior of the fractal and he can drag them and see what happens in real time to the tree, to the image of the tree, right? So the tree is redrawn in real time and he's, he's not typing numbers, he's, he's dragging, dragging right? Um, and, and so, and like when he does that kind of thing, he's able to discover a phenomenon that if he was sitting there typing and then going through a recompile cycle, he would never have discovered, right? And so that's his, so that's his principle of, of I want to reduce this gap between a creative process and the creative result. Like I want to, I want to be manipulating my creation in, you know, not necessarily in a tangible way because it's still on the computer screen in that case, but but in a in a an interactive way. Is that done in Rails? No. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I think I think Rails did Rails did the same thing yeah. in a sense for web applications. It reduced the barrier, like you ha you, you didn't have to go through and think about, well wait, so I got, okay, so I need to know SQL to do the queries, and I need to know, you know, like I need to figure out how to get it right to get, you know, inserts and updates and whatever. And, like you stop having to think about any of that, and you're just like, okay, yeah, I want you know a name and a, you know a comment thing, and you know like I'm writing a blog, right? Like, like right. there's a comment and then you know whatever, um, and you just go and write the app, and, and it's there, and it's ready, and it's going, and it's live. I think this is what Common List as a general purpose tool also accomplishes. It shortens the the distance between uh, programming and seeing results. But that's not no, that's not part of the common list. That's like, well, list is awesome for that. Right? That's yeah, only yeah, because yeah. it allows you to go. Like, there's another article that Victor writes, uh, climbing up and down the lattice of abstraction, right? So you build the abstractions that are best suited to express. Yeah, you're you finding your own language. Exactly. So list, phenomenal like that. But, but list doesn't make that easier. Exactly. You get lost in all the decisions that you can make, and how ambitious you can improve. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's an art form. <laughs> you're just. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Results, but but I mean, I mean, if you know, if if, if we're going to go with that analogy, then like you know, Rails is the color the numbers. Yeah. You know, and Maybe this and, and this is like eggs and pigment, and you have to make your own tempera. It's like okay, and then I will go cut down the tree to make the paper to make the canvas. <laughs> but I'll have a tree compiler. <laughs> well, so, you know, that's, yeah. well, and, and that's, that's the thing, right? You, you, you write the tempura maker, or, or not tempura, uh, tempura, whatever. You make the, 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 the paint, whatever it is. Um, you might you write the thing that makes it, and then you have it. And and so then later, but you won't. You can you can. And, and, and that's the problem <laughs> with Disney. Uh, perhaps <laughs> uh, just, just really quickly, can I personally answer these questions? Because if not, I'm going to go back to the top. So anybody wants to ask me anything, because I talk for a bit. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Have you had any success yet hiring people that do this? Um, so, yes and no. Um, I, we've gone through a lot of people, or we, we've talked to a lot of people. Um, we are, we are going to hire some list developers. Um, we are not hiring any common list developers. Um, finding good developers is really, really hard. And good developers, independently of what they already know, are really quick learners. So finding someone who already has common list experience, not a big deal. Finding someone who has enough interest in the technology and in the tools to have by themselves gone out and learned a list. I don't care what you know, I want you. Because you are the kind of person that I can give you a job and if you don't use the list, I really don't care. You know, 
I need, I've got business people telling me these are your tickets to do, get them done. So the kind of people who come and say, yeah, you know, I played with Liz, are also the kind of people who say, yeah, you know, I've also played with Erlang. Or, you know, maybe you should try this weird thingy. Um, so we're hiring list packers because they're just generally really good. Um, and, and we're not hiring any common, where's the number? Uh, we're hiring one guy who has some common list experience. But um, the overlap between good programmers and common list programmers, it tends to be great. Well, I mean, the same thing would be true if I said Erlang, if I said Haskell. Uh, and said small talk. Um, I just happen to know this, so that's where we started. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I, I was talking to some people that you know were thinking about starting a startup, and um, you know there was they were not technically so slow, so they were um, the question came up what technology to use, and I was making the point that it's probably a good idea to go for something that sticks out, like if you do Rails. So, so given that it's hard to find developers anyway. No matter what technology you use, and you can just as well pick something that is cool. We 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 put out a bunch of um, we put a bunch of ads. Um, yeah, so we put out a bunch of ads uh, when we were looking for Rails developers, um, and initially, um, a lot of the responses we got back either the first line of the response was "I'm 100 euro an hour plus umsatzsteuer." Um, So we're working on um, team rooms and meeting spaces, and since everybody just wanted, except for myself, plays in a band, <laughs> that will probably come up soon enough. <laughs> do you play in a band? I do not. Okay, so uh, he is also one of the new just wanted people. So that's 
two of us who don't play in a band. But one of the founders is a singer and a guitarist. The graphic designer is a drummer. Uh, Sean, the JavaScript god, is a piano player and tambourine. <laughs> we'll, we will definitely. One more, and you guys can start. <laughs> We're competing in the, uh, the Berlin startup battle of the bands. <laughs> That's a thing. Every year? <laughs> <laughs> It's a battle of the bands between uh, oh, bands that work in startups. <laughs> <laughs> or between startups, actually, because the band has to be made from the No, I, I missed the word band, so I thought it was programming it's band. Just it's just a battle? It's just a battle. People with knives made from keyboards. People with knives. Okay, so we're going to do some more questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jason, you were talking about how Yeah, I need, I need some people to...